Okay. <laughs> Woo. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about spatial memory in primates, and specifically spatial memory in the context of foraging. So I thought I would start out by giving you an example of a foraging decision I often face, um, which is that I'm sitting in my office, you know, working on my amazing presentation for the Duke Lemur Center 50th anniversary, um, and I realize I really need some coffee. So one option is that I just step around the corner and get some coffee, you know, at the kitchen near my office, um, or I could leave my office entirely and try to find one of these. Um, so how does a person make a decision like this? How do you just decide whether it's worth it to go for the, for the fancy coffee? Um, well, you might start out by uh, wanting to re pick out some information about the world. So you might consider the fact that if you go to the coffee shop, you're going to have to wait in line. It's going to take longer. Um, you might consider the fact that you'll leave your office and it'll end up that the coffee shop is closed. Or you might consider whether you even know where there is a coffee shop in the first place. Um, so my research on the whole actually looks at how different primate species integrate all these different kinds of information um, to engage in foraging behaviors. And today I'm just going to focus in on this last one, how, how different primate species use spatial information um, to engage in foraging behaviors. And the main point I want to make is that there's actually different ways that uh, different individuals could, could think about this kind of decision. So for one individual or one species, um, this sort of spatial information might loom really large. It might play a really big role in, in whether they decide to pursue um, the, the better option. Um, for another species, it might not matter that much. Um, and what this means is that uh, there's an intermediary between the information out there in the world and the actions we pursue, and that's cognition. And what I'm going to look at today is how different species um, use different kinds of cognitive skills to pursue different kinds of foraging behaviors. And what this means is that we might look at one species like this rough lemur, and they might take all this spatial information out there in the world and decide to pursue one kind of action, um, whereas another species like a shafak might look at that same information and decide to pursue a totally different kind of action. Um, so what I hope to convince you of today is that uh, very variation in the underlying cognitive skills that these animals are, are using to make spatial, uh, make spatial judgments are driving variation in their natural foraging behavior, and that the, the thing underpinning all of this variation is actually variation in their natural history, so variation in the wild socioecology of these species. Um, so the problem here is really why does cognition evolve? And we've heard a lot of examples from Michael and yesterday from Brian Hare and Evan McLean that one answer to this question is that cognitive skills um, emerge to solve social problems. Um, but today I'm going to actually talk about a, a different answer to this question, a different flavor of answer, which is that cognitive skills emerge to solve ecological problems. So I should mention that I don't think these are mutually exclusive. Um, they might account for different kinds of uh, cognitive skills. Um, but I'm going to focus in on the second one and specifically thinking about how cognition might evolve to solve ecological problems, and the cognition that's evolving is what I'm going to call foraging cognition. So I'm just going to use this as an umbrella term to refer to any kind of cognitive skills that play an important role in, in locating food resources. So at one level, this might include things like sensory perceptual systems that allow you to even detect food out there in the environment. Um, this might include things like memory system, what I'm going to talk about today. So memory for where resources are and how to navigate between them. This could include things like decision making. So how do different individuals or different species make trade-offs between different potential options that could have um, costs and benefits? Um, it might even include some components of social decision making because many social primates are actually foraging in the company of others. This means that certain forms of competition and cooperation actually are really important when, when engaging in foraging behaviors. So today I'm just going to focus in on this mem question of memory, but I think this sort of framework could be applied to many other kinds of cognitive skills as well. Um, and why lemur cognition? So we've heard a lot already uh, over the past two days about why lemurs are, are quite interesting, but just to reiterate, um, I think that there are really important uh, taxa for studies of cognitive evolution for two reasons. So one is they show incredibly high levels of diversity in their socioecology. So, so more diversity than we actually see in many other primate taxa. So this allows us to test um, really, really specifically hypotheses about why cognition is changing across species. Um, and I think another reason there are really great taxa to be interested in is that a lot of these hypotheses about evolution and, and cognitive evolution are coming from other groups. So they might be coming from anthropoid primates or, or corvids. So lemurs provide a really nice test of whether these hypotheses really hold up when we look at other species. 
Um, and I'm going to mention what the predictions were for these species in terms of uh, their, their variation in spatial memory. Um, so in these, I'm going to talk to you about three different experiments with these lemurs. Um, and they have some really interesting differences in their wild feeding ecology. So these rough lemurs are actually extremely frugivorous, so their diets can exceed 90% fruit in the wild. Um, and this means that they feed on very patchily distributed um, resources where you might really need some good spatial memory to remember where they are and navigate between them. Um, these ring-tailed and mongoose lemurs have a more mixed diet. So they, they can eat some fruit, it could be 30 to 60 percent, but they're eating a lot of other things too, like leaves, insects, etc. And then finally, these cockerel shafox are actually fairly folivorous, so they have special adaptations in their teeth and gut to digest leaves. Um, and a lot of behavioral ecologists will think of leaves as a more homogeneously distributed food resource that you don't really need to have such amazing spatial memory skills to locate um, out there in nature. Um, so based on this sort of pattern of their wild feeding ecology, we predicted that actually rough lemurs should exhibit the most accurate spatial memory. And this should be especially pronounced when comparing them to the shafox, who are this more folivorous species. Um, so I'm going to mention three components of spatial memory in today's talk. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is um, these lemurs' ability to recall a resource location over a long time, uh, specifically whether they can recall a location where food had been hidden over, over a week-long delay. The next thing I'm going to talk about is what kind of mechanism are they really using to do this? Um, are they re really remembering a place, a, a specific location in the world, or are they remembering a, a, ha a habit, so their actual body movements to get to that location? So this is a memory more akin to how we remember to, how to ride a bicycle. Um, so it's a procedural memory about how your body moves. So is it the case that they really remember these locations in space, or are they just remembering how they got there using their own body? Um, and then the last thing I'm going to talk about is whether they um, can remember multiple locations in a more complex space. And again, our prediction was that these forgivorous rough lemurs would outperform out all the other species, and especially the shafox, across these different components of spatial memory. Um, so here's the, here's the first study looking at spatial memory after a long delay. Um, so this is showing you a bird's eye view of what the setup looked like uh, in, in the testing room. Um, so what happened was is that on each trial, the lemur started at the bottom end of this T, um, and then it turned out that actually one of these two cups had a food reward in it. So these are showing two cups at the end of the platform. Um, and the question was, if they get some experience that that particular location is baited with food on one day, when we come back a week later, will they remember where that baited location was? So what happened was is that they had an introductory session where they got 12 trials, experiencing that there was food in that rewarded location. Um, and we let all the lemurs self-correct, so if they initially approached the wrong side, they could always correct themselves. So each individual lemur got 12 experiences getting food from that location. And then we came back one week later and just asked, do you remember where the food was, that you, where you had experienced it before? So here's a video of what this looked like. So you see one experimenter is baiting and then fake baiting the two ends of the cup, so both cups were touched. And now the, the other experimenter was distracting the lemur, and now the lemur is successfully approaching the correct choice. Um, I should mention that I'm not going to go into all the details, but the side was counterbalanced, and we always rubbed food on both cups to uh, remove the possibility that they were responding to um, odor cues. Okay, so our question was, when we came back a week later, did these lemurs remember where they had experienced the food being previously? I should mention that on the first uh, introductory trial, no lemur appro the lemurs approached the two cups a chance, so they didn't know where the food was if they hadn't already experienced it. But when we came back a week later, actually the rough lemurs preferred that correct location on their first test trial. So all 12 rough lemurs we tested approached that correct location on their very first trial of that day. I mean, actually no other species showed that preference. And then the thing I'm going to show you now is actually their improvement between these sessions. So the benefit that their experience in session one had on their performance in session two. Um, and the rough lemurs showed quite some improvement, and the key thing here is that the other lemurs showed less improvement, and the shafox especially basically performed the same in their introductory session and their test session, suggesting that basically each day the shafox showed up in this test, they could learn the location of the baited food, but they didn't recall this information, and it didn't help them when they came back a week later. Okay, so the, here's the first piece of evidence that actually the rough lemurs sort of, sort of outperforming these other species, and especially the shafox are maybe struggling a little bit. Um, but there was sort of two ways the animals could be solving that previous study, or solving that previous problem. So one possibility is that they were recalling that, okay, I have to go to this spot in space. 
But the other possibility is that they were calling, I have to turn right to get food. So we wanted to test do, which of these two things are they remembering. And the way we did this was by introducing a different kind of platform. Um, so here the lemurs would again learn that one of these two locations was baited. Um, and they would get several experiences that this location was baited. And then the trick to, to seeing whether they actually were remembering where the food was in space versus what the movements were that they made to get there was to flip them over to the other side of the platform. So now, if they remember which location in space they have to go to, they should still return to this same spot. But if they remember, oh, I turn right to get food, here they're actually gonna go to the other side. So this is a more habit or movement-based strategy. Um, so each lemur did six sessions, and in each session they did 12 of these trials um, where they learned um, where the food was in the initial position, and then one trial where um, they were flipped to the other side. Um, and here's a little video showing you what this looked like. So you can see the experimenter baiting and fake baiting the two locations. And the shafak is very successful at knowing where the food is. But now the shafak has been flipped to the other side. And, and this particular individual turned right. So does that make sense with, with the differences here? OK. So we were interested in what did they do on their very first probe trial, so they've not had any experience being flipped to this new side. And then across different probe trials, did individuals show a preference for one strategy or the other? And in fact, we found that only the rough lemurs preferred this, use this spatial response on their first probe trial. So 13 of the 15 we tested did that. Um, and when we looked, what we did was categorize each individual as being, on the whole, this individual made spatial responses, or on the whole, this individual made habit-based responses, or this individual is very confused, and sometimes they make a spatial response, and sometimes they make a habit response. Um, and so this is showing um, the breakdown of each species. So in the rough lemurs, uh, the vast majority of rough lemurs showed a strong spatial preference. So across these different probe trials, they were always showing that response, and a few were confused. Um, and the other three species actually showed a mixture, where some individuals showed this habit-based response, some individuals showed this spatial response, and some were kind of switching back and forth between the two kinds of responses. So again, this is some evidence that the, the not only are the rough lemurs remembering locations after a long duration, but they seem to be doing so using more spatial strategies, whereas these other species are using a mixture of habit and spatial strategies. Um, so the last thing we wanted to look at was, was translating this into a larger space, a more naturalistic foraging context. I and mean, what we did was actually introduce a variety of landmarks into these lemurs' homeroom and see if they could remember which landmarks had been baited. So there were four landmarks that were test locations. So these were locations where the lemurs initially experienced that there was food. And then there were four control locations where there had not been food previously. So uh, the lemurs could enter into this room and search at all these different landmarks. Um, and each landmark was unique, but here's one example of a landmark. So in the, in the exposure phase, um, they would see that half of the landmarks had a visible piece of food in there. And we let the lemurs just kind of wander around until they had picked up all four of these test pieces of food. Um, and then we took them out of the room for 10 minutes. So they had to hang out for 10 minutes and remember these locations over that time period. And then we let them back into the room after 10 minutes. And here, every single um, landmark had food hidden. In, in the little box, but the boxes were covered by a lid, so they couldn't see it as they were walking around the room. And the question was, would the lemurs preferentially approach those locations where they had just gotten food 10 minutes earlier? Um, so here's a little video of what it looks like um, when the lemurs were entering during this test phase. So you can see the lemur going into the room. And there's Carrie. Okay, so this lemur, actually the very first one that they approached was actually a control location that had not had food um, in it the previous time. So now we're gonna see the lemur very slowly eating that food. <laughs> so now the question is, what's the next place that this lemur is gonna go? Oh, and it's another control location, so this lemur messed up again. <laughs> and so we basically just looked, where did these lemurs approach um, as they went through um, these different landmarks? And they got 10 minutes to search all these different landmarks, which was more than enough time for them to, to find all these different pieces of food. <laughs> 
Right, finally, this lemur went to a test location. So finally, the lemur got something right. Um, so, so this video is actually a little deceptive because it's implying that the rough lemurs did kind of badly at this task. But actually, that was one of the, one of the few rough lemurs that didn't do so well because the other 10 rough lemurs actually approached a test location on their first approach. So the very first location they went to was one at which they had gotten food the previous time. I mean, I should mention that all these locations were counterbalanced across individuals to make sure that they didn't just approach the one right in front of them or they didn't have a preference for one kind of shape versus another. Um, and then our question was how many total of these test pieces did the lemurs pick up um, in their first four searches? So the idea here is that if you're a lemur that remembers where the food had been hidden, you might approach those four locations first, then when you're in the room for this long period of time, you might still check out the other ones. That's not unreasonable. But the first four searches you make should be preferentially um, those, those test locations. Um, and what we found was that actually rough lemurs on the whole were preferentially searching at these test locations, and these other species were not showing as strong of a preference. And actually, three of the Shafox, when they entered the room, um, 10 minutes after they had just gotten food in that room, they didn't do anything. They just sat in the middle of the room didn't look at any, not even a single landmark at all. Um, so, so that sort of being driven by some individual, some of the Shafox seem to not only not remember multiple locations, but not even remember that there was food in the first place. Um, so coming back to how I introduced this, um, we found that these more frugivorous rough lemurs um, seem to recall resource locations better after a one, one week delay. Um, that they use spatial strategies specifically to encode where those locations were as opposed to these more habit or movement based strategies and that they were better at remembering multiple locations in a complex space. Um, so in the last part of the talk, I, I want to introduce some of my other work, which is actually looking at how, how apes are making um, these same kinds of memory judgments. And I think it's sort of interesting both to add to what we found with the lemurs, but also to maybe potentially compare how the lemurs and the apes were, were doing all these tasks. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about research at two sanctuaries, two Congolese ape sanctuaries, so Loli Abanobo Sanctuary in DRC and Chimpunga Chimpanzee Sanctuary in Republic of Congo. Um, and actually, we had sort of very similar predictions for how these apes would perform um, relative to each other. So they don't have as uh, major differences in their feeding ecology as the lemurs, but they have sort of a similar pattern. So specifically, based on different aspects of their feeding ecology, we had predicted that the, the chimpanzees who seem to feed or be more dependent on fruit than the bonobos would also have better spatial memory than the bonobos, um, and also that they would be more patient and more risk-prone based on patterns of for extractive foraging and hunting in these species. So I'm just going to focus on the spatial memory prediction. Um, and I'm also going to present you some evidence that the way this species difference um, in spatial memory arises is actually through changes in developmental timing. So one of the things we can do at the ape sanctuaries is actually test very large number of juveniles to see how differences in cognition emerge over development. Um, so actually, we tested these apes on two of the same tasks that I just talked to you about in lemurs. So we tested them on a, on a task where they had to recall multiple locations. In the apes' case, we didn't put them in a small room like the lemurs because they're quite large. We actually had them search in a, in a larger outdoor enclosure where they had watched uh, a human experimenter hide food at four locations. And then there were four pieces of food that had already been placed there um, to serve as controls. Um, and just like the lemurs, they had to wait a 10-minute delay between observing this baiting procedure and then being able to enter the, the enclosure to search for food. Um, and then we also tested them on a version of this one-week delay task. Um, here the food was just hidden under one of two uh, overturned containers. Um, but again, they just like the lemurs, they did 12 trials on an initial day, and then we came back one week later to see, do you remember which of these containers had the food? Um, so here's... Uh, the ape's performance on this multiple location study. So the first thing I want to point out is that they were using spatial memory because they preferentially approached these test locations where they had seen food hidden. Um, but actually, there was a big difference over development in, in how this emerged. So when we looked at the infant and the infant chimpanzees and the infant bonobos, they actually look quite similar, but these older chimpanzees are actually outperforming all of the other groups. So across this age range, between about two years of age and about 12 years of age, um, chimpanzees are really improving in their ability to recall multiple uh, locations in space, whereas the bonobos are just kind of flatlining. So an infant bonobo remembers the same number of locations as, a, as an almost adult bonobo. Um, and in this second task, looking at their memory over a long delay, um, I should mention that there was no difference in their introductory performance. So then this is looking at how much their introductory performance helped them in the second session. 
Um, much like how with the lemurs, I showed you that the rough lemurs showed the most improvement when they came back a week later. And, you know, puzzlingly, we found that the, the infant bonobos actually showed quite some improvement, and the adult bonobos actually got worse than the infant bonobos. So they didn't even just flatline, they were worse. Um, in contrast with the chimps, there was no age change. So both younger chimps and older chimps showed sort of the same um, improvement across these two sessions uh, with no change with age. Um, and I thought it might be fun to show you their performance on their very first trial. So I already mentioned that the rough lemurs, 12 out of 12 rough lemurs, remembered which location was baited on the very first trial where they came back. So here's just showing you the lemur data there. So you can see the rough lemurs are at ceiling. Um, and, and sort of amusingly, the chimps and bonobos were not doing very well. So I wanted to show you this because I think it's the only time we found the apes actually underperforming compared to some lemurs. Um, so yay, lemurs. <laughs> yeah, so, so these rough lemurs we're really, we're really doing quite amazingly in this task. Um, but just to sum up the, the APE work, um, we found that uh, in this multiple location study, there was a difference in adulthood between the chimps and bonobos, and this actually emerged over development. So the very young chimps and bonobos showed similar performance, um, and it was through this developmental trajectory that chimpanzees actually developed this species difference relative to how the bonobos were performing. Um, in the long delay task, uh, it was sort of a similar outcome with a different pattern, the chimps actually didn't change over development and the bonobos somehow got worse. Um, so suggesting that there's sort of two ways you can acquire um, this species difference in performance. Um, but in general, this suggests that changes in the developmental timing of, the, of cognitive development is, is producing this variation in ape cognition. And I think this um, leads to some very interesting questions about whether the same thing is going on um, with the lemurs here at the lemur center. Um, and so we haven't actually looked at these sorts of age-related changes in the lemurs, but now that we have all this amazing data on, on life history variables and so on and so forth with these species, I think it's a really interesting question whether these same developmental processes are producing variation in lemur cognition. Um, so just to sum up, I showed you some evidence that cognition can differ adaptively across species, um, specifically with lemurs with these um, different feeding ecologies seem to use different kinds of spatial, um, spatial me mechanisms to remember locations in space. Um, and then I showed you some evidence from apes that one way that these variation in, in, in species cognition can arise is through developmental shifts. Um, so going back to um, my first uh, example, um, I think the key take on point here is that actually natural selection only can see your behavioral phenotypes, so what animals are actually doing. But I hope I've convinced you that actually um, these cognitive mechanisms that are producing the behavioral phenotype are really important to try to understand how cognition is evolving. Um, and I think that integrating these sorts of psychological and biological approaches can really illuminate the process of cognitive evolution um, in lemurs and, and also in humans. Uh, and I want to thank, uh, again, Brian Hare and Kerry Rodriguez, who were my collaborator on these studies, um, and especially Sarah Zare and David Brewer, who were instrumental in being able to, to do this research at the Duke Lemur Center. Thank you. Thank you.